Our topic is the issue of eschatology, and in particular, what is eschatology in the context of Christianity and a Christian worldview? Now, when we're looking at the word eschatology, eschatos in Greek basically refers to last or end, and then you put the ology onto that coming from logos. It basically refers to the study of last things, or we're looking at events to come. So within a Christian worldview standpoint, eschatology is looking at events and things that still need to happen. Now, I just wanted to point out that there are a lot of passages in the Bible that actually refer to the latter days and the last days and the last times. And so we're not going to go through all of those, but uh, you know, I mentioned here Deuteronomy 4.30, where God is talking about doing certain things for Israel in the latter days. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2 talks about that in the last days, there's going to be this kingdom from Jerusalem where the nations are going to uh, worship the Lord, lay down their weapons of warfare, and come to him for instruction. Uh, in Daniel chapter 10, verse 14, latter days is used of instruction that's being given to Daniel. Um, other passages like Hosea 3, 5 talk about in the last days in connection with the Messiah, with, with the ultimate David, that God was going to give uh, his goodness to Israel in the last days. <clears throat> and so there, there's many passages, you know, including Matthew 24, uh, the Olivet Discourse, where uh, Jesus is being asked about the sign of his coming and the end of the age. Uh, and then in like 2 Timothy 3, 1, uh, Paul said, realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. So he's talking about difficult times in the last days. Uh, the word that he uses for last there is related uh, to our uh, eschatos term. Here it's eschatos. Uh, in 2 Peter 3, 3a, Peter said, know this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking. And again, that word for last there is the word related uh, to eschatology that we are discussing here. So I just wanted to show you those passages just to indicate that there are a lot of passages and even more than we mentioned, you know, dealing with the issue of the latter days and the last times and dealing with events to come. Uh, you might also want to note too that eschatology is part of the uh, systematic theology categories. If you were to pick up a systematic theology book that's looking at Christian doctrine in a systematic way, you know, you'll see categories like theology proper, Christology, pneumatology, et cetera, et cetera. And you, then usually what you'll see last is a reference to eschatology. Now, eschatology is not the least important of the doctrines, uh, but it does make sense that when we're dealing with how all things wrap up in Christ, as we transition from this present age to the age to come and what that means, uh, that that would be uh, looked at last. It, it, it's been true, I think, in history as well. Uh, throughout history, oftentimes certain doctrines have been really focused on and I think it's probably true to say that eschatology has been one of the latter doctrines uh, to be discussed. Uh, it really began to be looked at more closely uh, post-Reformation uh, in the 1600s and 1700s. There ended up being more attention given to eschatology. And then really in the 1800s and the 1900s, there was a lot of specific uh, discussion on eschatology. So even from a historical standpoint, it's been uh, one of the later doctrines to be looked at. Now, on this particular slide, I just wanted to show you that there are very many major passages that address eschatology. I've, I've listed the uh, Old Testament, certain Old Testament passages on the left, and then certain New Testament passages on the right. There's others I could have included in here. I probably should have mentioned, uh, you know, Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 and uh, Daniel 9 and Daniel 11 and Daniel 12. Uh, there's just, um, you know, all of the all of the minor prophets at some point have sections, to, you know, to be, dealing with the issue of eschatology. There's many passages in the New Testament dealing with eschatology. You know, the Matthew 24 and 25, Mark 13, Luke 21, those are all dealing with Jesus's Olivet Discourse concerning the destruction of the temple, uh, uh, the day of the Lord, the return of Christ, abomination of desolation, cosmic signs, those kinds of things. Uh, First Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians have major sections devoted to the rapture, to the day of the Lord, to the second coming of Christ to earth. And there's even information about the Antichrist in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Second uh, Peter 3 is dealing with the uh, coming uh, fiery purging uh, of, of the heavens and the earth, which is going to lead to the new heavens and the new earth. And then Revelation uh, chapter 6 to 22 is, is loaded uh, with many uh, eschatological events and things that are going to occur, mostly connected with the seals, the trumpets, and the bulls. So I just wanted to put this up just to show that there are there are so many passages that are specifically dealing with eschatology and oftentimes in great detail that we have to look at eschatology in order to have our Christian worldview right. 
Uh, remember, the Christian worldview is made up of various parts. There's creation, there's fall, there's promise, which is basically the uh, the promise and the messianic hope and the covenant stemming from Genesis 3.15 uh, onward to the time of Christ. Uh, the fourth uh, major part of the story will be Christ first coming with redemption and atonement, with implications for the church and spiritual blessings associated with the new covenant. But there is that fifth part of the story that is coming. That is the restoration of all things. And that really gets into our study of eschatology, because the restoration of all things is really going to be dealing with a lot of events that are associated with the second coming of Jesus. So we do need to be intentional, and uh, we need to have uh, the study of eschatology on the board, <laughs> because this is a major part of the Christian worldview and, and the Christian storyline. Now, discussions of eschatology have often you know, pointed out that there are, you know, there are two categories of eschatology that we uh, we need to look at. The first is individual eschatology, and when we're looking at individual eschatology, uh, that primarily deals with the issue of the person. Like, wh what what is the destiny of you as a person? Is me as a person? So this is very practical. So uh, individual eschatology addresses issues like what is death? Where do I go when I die? Uh, where does my soul go? What is the intermediate state? Uh, you know, we believe really, there's a future coming of Christ with resurrections and judgments, but what happens to people in this age when they die? What happens to a believer who dies in this age? What is heaven like for them? Uh, what happens when an unbeliever dies in this age? Uh, there's discussion, you know, about the issue of Hades. So what is Hades like uh, for the unbeliever who dies in this particular age? Uh, also, the question of when will I be judged? Am I judged immediately after death, or are there judgments associated with the second coming of Christ that come later? So any of those types of issues that deal with the future of the individual, particularly concerning death and the afterlife, those are usually the areas associated with individual eschatology. Now, most discussions of eschatology go towards the second category that we refer to here. There's also what is called cosmic eschatology, uh, sometimes referred to as universal eschatology or general eschatology, and, and this is a broader category. So usually cosmic eschatology is going to be dealing like with the future of planet Earth and the world. You know, there's going to be this a burning up of the Earth, but there's also discussion of a new heavens and a new Earth. So what's all involved uh, with the judgment of the Earth and then the new heavens and the new Earth? Or even even the universe itself. When you read eschatology sections, there's things going on with the sun, the moon, and the stars. Um, are the are the cosmic bodies around during the millennial kingdom and the eternal state? Those those are issues related to co cosmic eschatology. And and usually, oftentimes, the thing that anchors discussion of cosmic eschatology is the second coming of Christ to Earth. So Jesus' second coming to Earth, and then the events surrounding that, both. But uh, before that and after that are, again, usually connected with cosmic eschatology. So now again, remember when Jesus came with his first coming, his first coming wasn't just one day. <laughs> so when we talk about the first coming of Christ. There's actually some things that play out over a few years and then with implications even for, you know, the aftermath with the church age that we're in. Likewise, with the second coming of Christ, um, the second coming of Jesus involves more than just the day he touches down on earth. It also involves the day of the Lord, um, what, which probably is a seven-year period that's playing out before Jesus returns to earth. So uh, basically what we're saying here is that events associated with the second coming of Jesus are going to involve multiple things. You know, so one of them is the issue of the rapture, which is discussed in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and then another one would be the day of the Lord, which is this intense time of God's judgment upon the world, which leads up to Jesus returning to earth. So sometimes that's referred to as the tribulation period. Sometimes it's linked with what we call the 70th week of Daniel, going back to Daniel 9:27. Um, there's other issues associated with cosmic eschatology, such as the future of Israel. So in Romans 11, 26, Paul says, all Israel will be saved. And then there's many passages uh, in the Old Testament, and then there's discussion of it in the New Testament that Israel be restored as a nation. That's part of cosmic eschatology. <clears throat> there's also various passages that talk about uh, the career of the Antichrist, like in Daniel 9, 27, uh, in the latter verses of, of Daniel chapter 11, uh, Paul talks about a man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, who goes into the temple, declares himself to be God. Uh, in the book of Revelation, uh, there's, in chapter 13, there's discussion of a beast who does uh, various things. We believe he's the Antichrist as well. So um, although 
uh, most cosmic eschatology is rightly focused on Christ, there does end up being this man that Satan is using to try to accomplish Satan's purposes. So cosmic eschatology does account for the Antichrist. And then also when it comes to the millennial kingdom of Jesus that Christ establishes at his second coming, where Jesus ful fulfills the Adamic mandate for a successful role of man from and over the earth to the glory of God, 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 28 says that when Jesus has completed his successful reign, he hands the kingdom over to God the Father. And then you go into the eternal state, you know, which is mentioned next on our list here. Uh, Revelation 21 to 22 does talk about an eternal state. Uh, talks about new heavens and new earth you know, after the millennial kingdom with nations and people serving God and what that looks like. So that's a part of cosmic eschatology. And then the resurrections and judgments. Uh, there's various resurrections discussed in scripture. You see one in the rapture passage of 1 Thessalonians 4. Um, there's also a resurrection that's talked about in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, uh, in, in connection to martyred saints who, who come to life. There's a resurrection that's talked about after the end of the millennium. Uh, according to Revelation chapter 20, verse 5. And then there's various judgments in Scripture. Um, uh, Joel 3 talks about a judgment of the nations on behalf of Israel. Um, uh, Matthew 25, 31 to 46 talks about a judgment of the nations. It's called the sheep goat judgment. Uh, there's a judgment of what's called the great white throne judgment in uh, Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15. So when it comes to those resurrections and judge, judgments, it seems to be that there's various stages and phases of those. So trying to put that all together, uh, is also part of cosmic eschatology. So, so you can see from these um, that there are a lot of uh, a lot of categories and a lot of things to look at when it comes to the issue of cosmic eschatology. Now, I want to point out here that when we are dealing with eschatology, there are going to be various phases when it comes to fulfillment of eschatology. Now, one of the things that we want to note is, uh, you know, really ever since uh, Genesis 3 with the prediction of the coming seed of the woman who is going to defeat evil and defeat Satan, you know, there have been predictions that have been going all throughout the Bible. So there, there's actually a lot of predictions in the book of Genesis. Um, there's, you know, a lot of predictions all the way throughout the Old Testament. We know that with the major prophets uh, and the minor prophets. And so there's a lot of predictions going on. And we do know that biblical history is playing out over a pretty long period of time. So one of the things that we want to make sure is that when it comes to eschatology or future events or predicted events, we have to understand when these prophecies were given and when they're fulfilled in history. We are not claiming that all prophecy in the Bible awaits future fulfillment. Uh, that's, that's not the case. Now, there are a lot of things that do await future fulfillment, but as this first category states, there have been certain things that were fulfilled in Old Testament times. So our first phase or category of eschatology fulfillment would be Old Testament fulfillment. So Old Testament fulfillment occurs when there is a prediction or a prophecy about something to come that's, you know, at the time of the writing in the Old Testament, it had, it had not occurred yet, but within Old Testament history, um, that did become fulfilled. Like, for example, in Genesis 12, God told Abraham that his name would become great. Well, it did become great in Old Testament times. It still remains great, uh, but that happened. Uh, Genesis 12 uh, verses two to three also tell us that there would be a great nation coming from Abraham that eventually would bless the families and nations of the world. Well, that great nation we know is Israel. Now, if, obviously, Israel developed in Old Testament times. Uh, you know, most of the Old Testament is talking about Israel. So Israel becoming a nation, uh, I mean, that has experienced fulfillment. Uh, the prophecies about Israel being blessed in the land of promise in Old Testament times, uh, those came true promises of Israel's uh, curses and dispersion to other nations, um, there's been some fulfillment of that. I mean, there's there are predictions concerning Israel being taken captive by Assyria and Babylon, and we know that those happened historically. And even in passages like uh, Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, um, those, those chapters talk about the rise of various nations. Like in Daniel 2, uh, we believe um, that the statue dream of Nebuchadnezzar was referring to Babylon and Medo-Persia and Greece and the Roman Empire. But all of that to say, and there's many others that we could use, is uh, there are no doubt, there is no doubt that there have been fulfillments of certain Old Testament prophecies that occurred in Old Testament history, even before the time of Christ. Now, that does bring us to our second category of fulfillment, and this is a very important one, and it is this. There are prophecies in the Old Testament that were fulfilled with the first coming of Jesus and then the, the aftermath of that with the church that we now live in. Uh, and so, you know, there were many 
uh, what we call messianic hope prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament, Genesis 3.15, uh, Jesus is that seed uh, who was predicted who would someday defeat Satan. Uh, Genesis 49, verse 10, talks about a coming Shiloh um, who would bring uh, prosperity and, and health and restoration to the earth. Uh, Isaiah 52 and 53 talked about a suffering servant who would atone for the sins of Israel and bring uh, blessings to the kings and the nations of the earth. And so uh, we are affirming that there are many things that were promised in Old Testament history that find direct fulfillment with Jesus. So thus the arrival of Jesus, the Messiah, is a, is a fulfillment of Old, of Old Testament promises. You had a messianic hope in the Old Testament, and then Jesus ends up being the referent for those messianic promises. So the person we now know as Jesus is the fulfillment of the messianic hope. Predictions concerning the death and resurrection of Jesus, as we mentioned in Isaiah 52, 53, that's fulfilled with Christ. Um, the predictions that the Messiah would, would bring the new covenant ministry of the Holy Spirit, including the, the indwelling, permanent indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit, uh, that occurs as a result of the aftermath of Jesus' uh, resurrection and ascension, when in Acts 2, the Spirit is poured forth on the followers of Jesus. There's fulfillment there. Uh, Acts chapter 15, verses 13 to 18 talks about messianic salvation going to Gentiles as Gentiles because of the work of the ultimate Davidic king, referencing back to you know Amos 9 uh, verses 11 and 12. Now we could go on and on and on, but the main point that we're making here that you should grasp is that not only are there Old Testament fulfillments of prophecies from the Old Testament, but there, there are significant fulfillments of Old Testament prophecies with the person and work and ministry of Jesus with his first coming. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 states that in these last days that God has spoken to us in his son. So we are right to say that the first coming of Jesus with his person and work has inaugurated the last days. There is a sense in which the messianic era has unfolded as Jesus the Messiah has arrived and he has done certain things, particularly the suffering servant ministry and what he's doing for believing Jews and Gentiles in this age. Now, with that said, we also have to understand that there is a third area of fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies, and this is the category of second coming of Jesus fulfillment. So what we are saying here is that there are, pro there are prophecies from the Old Testament that are still awaiting future fulfillment in connection with the second coming of Christ. So realize that we can do both, <laughs> that we understand that there are major areas of prophecy that were fulfilled with Jesus's first coming, but also because there are two comings of the Messiah, that there are major events that still need to occur in connection with the second coming of Jesus. And what would those things be? I mean, now these are some of the things that we mentioned under cosmic eschatology, but the coming of the day of the Lord in the tribulation period in the 70th week of Daniel, that still awaits future fulfillment. In 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul told the Thessalonians that they could know that they were not in the day of the Lord because the man of lawlessness had not been revealed yet and the apostasy had not yet occurred. Now, there's a lot of debate on the issue of the apostasy, but when it comes to the man of lawlessness being revealed, that's the Antichrist of Daniel 9.27, who signs a seven-year covenant with the people of Israel, promising them peace, a covenant which he breaks at the midway point. So the fact that you need the coming Antichrist to make a seven-year covenant with the people of Israel, that's what starts really this 70th week of Daniel and what many would consider to be the day of the Lord like myself. That hasn't occurred yet. So we believe the day of the Lord and the tribulation in the 70th week of Daniel are future. We believe the salvation of all Israel is still future. That's what Paul promises uh, or talked about Romans 11, 26, all Israel will be saved. We have not seen the salvation of corporate, ethnic, national, territorial Israel at this point, but that will occur in the future, along with restoration promises to Israel. Of course, the second coming of Jesus to earth has not occurred yet. Uh, the millennial kingdom of Jesus, where he returns to reign upon the earth for a thousand years before the eternal state, we're still waiting for that to happen. The eternal kingdom of Revelation 21 to 22, we're still waiting for that to happen. And then the judgments and the resurrections that we discussed. I mean, clearly we, we don't, we do not have resurrected bodies yet, <laughs> but both the Old and the New Testament, Old and New Testaments predict that we are going to have resurrection uh, bodies uh, in, in connection with, with the return of Christ. So 
there are still um, quite a few things that uh, still need to occur. And again, we, we believe that that makes sense. Uh, we shouldn't say everything was fulfilled with Jesus's first coming, and we shouldn't say that everything will be fulfilled with the second coming, because since there are two comings of Jesus, the Messiah, it makes sense that the fulfillment of God's purposes would occur in phases. So to put it all together, what we've said is, number one, there are Old Testament prophecies that were fulfilled in the Old Testament. There are also Old Testament prophecies that were fulfilled with the first coming of Jesus. And then third, there are prophecies in the Old Testament that still await future fulfillment with the return of Jesus. And I, I just wanted to point out to you a passage here that I think is helpful in understanding this. Uh, in Acts chapter 3, verses 18 to 21, Peter is speaking to the men of Israel after Jesus had, had ascended to heaven and poured forth his spirit, and he points out first coming fulfillment and second coming fulfillment, both of them being based on the prophets. So if you look in verse 18, Peter said, the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, which would be the Old Testament prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. So there you go, that's first coming fulfillment. The suffering servant ministry of Jesus the Messiah was fulfilled with his first coming. And Peter explicitly says that. The prophets predicted that. Jesus has fulfilled it. But notice second coming fulfillment in verse 20. Peter also goes on to say, and that he may send Jesus the Christ or the Messiah appointed for you, appointed, appointed for the people of Israel. Notice whom heaven must receive. So the Messiah has to go to heaven for a little while until what? Until the period of restoration of all things. Now, the period of restoration of all things is referring to the kingdom. It's referring really to what it says, the restoration of all things, uh, to the restoration of planet Earth, to the restoration of the inanimate creation, to the restoration of animals that's talked about in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 6 to 10. This would be very parallel to Romans 8, 19 to 22, when Paul was talking about all creation was groaning, waiting to be delivered, when, um, when the people of God received their resurrection bodies, the redemption of the body. So... Peter's talking about here about a period of the restoration of all things. And notice that this restoration of all things is connected with what? About which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. So the Old Testament prophets, in addition to predicting the suffering servant ministry of who we now know as Jesus, also predicted the restoration of all things, including the earth and the renovation of the universe in every way. So Peter links that second coming fulfillment of the restoration of all things with the sending of the Christ, with the sending of Jesus again. So he's talking about second coming fulfillment and kingdom promises in Acts uh, 3 verses 20 to 21. So just to sum up, this is just a great passage where Peter in the same context says, hey, Jesus has already fulfilled the promises of, of, that the prophets stated about suffering. But the prophets also predicted that the Messiah would restore all things, and that's going to occur with the second coming of Jesus. And then just to wrap up here, you know, we want to make a practical statement here, uh, in addition to just stating what eschatology is. But, you know, the Bible presents eschatology as very practical uh, for the person. Uh, now, in one sense, for the unbeliever, eschatology is a warning to be on the right side of history. <laughs> so if a person is not saved, they need to come to Jesus for salvation, um, because the Bible talks about an awful destiny uh, connected with the day of the Lord and the lake of fire that no person uh, should want to be a part of. But for the person who is a believer, for the one who's in union with Christ, the study of eschatology does certain things. First of all, it informs us on how God's story culminates. Remember, the Bible storyline matters from beginning to end, and God is moving in history from creation to fall to promise to the first coming of Jesus to the restoration of all things with the second coming of Jesus. So it is very helpful for us not only to appreciate the salvation that we have as individuals in Christ— with our redemption from sin and our union with him, but to understand where we are in relation to God's purposes. So studying eschatology helps us know what's already been fulfilled in the Old Testament, what's already been fulfilled with the first coming of Christ, but also it helps us understand those things that are still yet to come. And secondly, it gives us hope. There's all kinds of passages like 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 to 58, Passages that talk about the return of the Lord, passages that talk about resurrection, um, those passages are stated to, to give us hope and to not lose heart. And even though we live in difficult times in a present evil age, that Jesus is coming again to restore all things. So there's a lot of hope uh, in eschatology. And then also it is a motivation to us to godly living. So that's a big part of eschatology practically, is it is a motivation for us to godly living. I think of 2 Peter chapter 3, 
verses 11 to 14, where Peter is talking about uh, the day of the Lord and the purging of the earth and the heavens with fire. And he's talking about the coming new heavens and new earth. And I just wanted to point out the practical applications in this section. He says in verse 11, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? So in light of coming future events, this should make you holy and godly. And then he says in verse 13, but according to his promise, we are what? Looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So we live in a present evil age, but we're looking forward to the return of Christ because that brings a new heaven and a new earth and then righteousness dominates. And then verse 14, therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. So again, this just ends with uh, ethical exhortation towards being in peace, spotless and blameless, because we know that our God is in sovereign control of all things. And the more we understand that, the more that is going to help us with our hope and motivate us to godliness.